CataractCoach.com, podcast number seven, with Arsham Shebani. He's a glaucoma specialist and anterior segment surgeon at Washington University in St. Louis. And he is revolutionizing the surgical treatment of glaucoma. We know he's a brilliant innovator. We've had his video here on the past about the bang technique, B-A-N-G. Look it up, CataractCoach.com. Innovative way, low-cost way for one or two U.S. pennies, cents, to do a glaucoma surgery that MIGS, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. But he thinks of glaucoma differently. You know, 20 years ago when I was a resident, I just didn't find glaucoma all that appealing. But now it's a different story, especially when you have Dr. Shabani explaining how he sees it as a full spectrum of surgical care and how he integrates that into anterior segment surgery, reconstructive surgery, even simple cataract surgery. It's all on the same spectrum for him. I am really fond of his work. I think he's brilliant. And I learned so much from this interview. It's just an hour, so quick and easy. Remember, you can always get our podcasts on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, wherever you find your podcasts. But check it out. I think you'll really enjoy it. So welcome to the Cataract Coach Podcast. I want to welcome Arshim Shabani, who's at Wash U in St. Louis. Technically, you're a glaucoma specialist, but I actually admire your work because you're doing everything in the anterior segment, which I think is a very different way of thinking about, let's say, glaucoma than we did years ago. Tell me more yeah. about that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I really appreciate being on here. You impact a ton of our residents, a ton of our trainees. I mean, it's uh, before we even jump into that, it's funny because... I will have residents and fellows tell me about techniques that they saw in your videos. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, but you know, if, if we kind of think about anterior segment and glaucoma, they really tie in together. When I was a resident, I assumed that a lot of the post-trauma stuff was going to maybe like cornea or retina, and they still do a, a large fair share. But a lot of these um, you know, post-traumas or surgical complication cases, they end up leading to high pressures. And so uh, I think it's just a natural union that, that you have to be able sure. to do the anterior segment side as well as the glaucoma side so you don't have to stage surgeries for patients. Yeah, I think that's a really great move. Because, yeah, in the old ways, like I would think of um, – I'm older than you. 20 years ago when I was a resident, the thing was like, oh, yeah, just – you do whatever you want in the anterior segment. But when the pressure is high, then dump it on the glaucoma specialist, and they'll do a tube or a trap. Yep. Yep. That's exactly how it was, right? And, and it was when we were just treating pressure and not mechanism, yeah. that's what you did. You lowered the pressure. You added a drop. You did a laser. You did a tube. You did a trap. We just tried to get to a number. And I think glaucoma has gone very mechanistic now, sure. as it should. And so when you start to treat mechanism, you're going to have to start to treat the anterior segment. There's just no way around it. Well, and I love how you just combine even, the, like you were saying, the complicated trauma cases where the patient has big trauma. They have a, no capsular support left. You have to do it, take the lens out, do a vitrectomy, do a Yamane. And yes, you've got to manage the angle disease, the angle recession, whatever they've got all in one sitting, which is what I thought was amazing. You, you, you nailed it. I mean, today, you know, part of my other hat is I actually work with our retina fellows and uh, they get FACOs, they get IOL cases. Um, we had... Uh, six combined cases that the fellow did today and um, wow. it included pupiloplasties um, and, and the angle stuff comes with it and if you don't understand how to treat the IOP in the least invasive way then you're potentially tubing everybody even if you're a good anterior segment surgeon but if you're just like a MIGS or angle surgeon I mean you could run into trouble too because sure. these cases sometimes end up with a little hypotony when you're making scleral wounds and and you have passes for even Yamani or like a four-point fixation technique you have to learn that, hey, listen, like maybe you have to tilt a little bit toward viscodilations with your goniotomies and, and pressure management, even post-op, like when to add diamox, when to take their glaucoma drops off, when to continue them. It, it gets pretty complicated to the point where I think if you're only treating gla glaucoma or IOP, or if you're only treating the anterior segment, you're going to run into more issues than if you're someone that kind of has that idea of treating them both together. So, yes, yeah, so you're basically doing the entire spectrum, which I thought was the, the most amazing part. Any, any part of the spectrum of glaucoma is your cup of tea. I love it, man. It is, look, and it's one of these things, Uday, you know how it is, that you do not win them all. And yeah. I never want to give anyone that impression. And in fact, I want to give people the impression that I don't care who you are, people are going to lose some of these battles. You yeah. just know that you're trying to do the best that you can. But 
Um, you, you handle a broad spectrum so that you see a broad variety of problems that come up. And I always tell the residents, it is shocking to me how many things can happen in such a small space. Right, exactly. It's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> and, and you have to be prepared for it. And the only way you can be prepared for it is either you have the forethought to kind of yeah. you know, be a step ahead to for predict sure. how things occur. But you know how it is with like PCRs. It can happen on a, a, yeah. a whim. Um, or you have to have so much experience. Actually, I think that's why teaching is so critical. Like what you're doing with your videos, like reviewing videos, staffing resident cases, you're going to learn way more. There are things that will happen in their hands that wouldn't happen in yours, not because they're worse than you or you're better than them. It's just we all think about things differently. Sure. Slight little changes in position. Reactions are different. Right. Um, and it's it's a super interesting thing to think about. But I, I don't think you really understand the gamut of, of what can happen in complications until you teach. You're right. Well, I was talking to someone earlier today about anterior vitrectomy. And he says, about how many anterior vitrectomies have you staffed with residents? I said, well, let's call it one a week for the last 22 years. So a thousand. Yeah. So they're yeah. like, wow, that's it's quite the experience. Well, but it's unplanned. And what's, right. what's crazy about that is, you know, like you go in and you have a case that's already got VIT moving forward. Like there's a plan to manage it. Sure. Like you have to think on the fly now. Surprise. And, and, yeah. Totally different ball game. But yeah. I, I think also like a very valuable one. And, and I, when you go back to thinking about the glaucoma surgeon, um, sure, I think you can really do a good glaucoma practice and not do the anterior segment stuff. I'm not saying that at all. Sure. But if you want to try to minimize the number of procedures that a patient has and um, kind of be someone where like the buck stops at you as much yeah. as it can, I think you really do have to combine the two. And then that leads you down a different path, right? Like you start going down the refractive path, the eye will exchanges for if someone's unhappy with a multifocal sure. or dysphotopsias or refractive outcomes. And, um, and there's still times like Uday, honestly, I wish that I did LASIK surgery um, and I did more carotid refractive procedures because I think I could augment my armamentarium. But at some point, like you kind of have to like draw the line as far as what you do. <laughs> L LASIK surgery is much easier than glaucoma <laughs> surgery. I'll be the very first to admit that. But you know what I love is there's something about your fellowship. I had a senior resident this last year who just matched with you, Gio Campagna. I can't wait. I can't wait. An, and he's an amazing young man. Amazing. Yeah. And he, he, says, he says, of all the entire fellowships in the entire country, and there are a ton of great fellowships. Yeah. He's like, no, no, I, I want to be with Arshim Shabani. Well, I want that <laughs> fellowship. I was, like, well, I was like, wow, you better bring your A game, Arshim. <laughs> well, no, it, you know, I, uh, it, it's funny like thinking of it that way because I look and – I'm like, man, our section is just fantastic. Like, sure. you get such a well-rounded uh, experience, and and um, and just watch. Give it a couple of years, but um, there's a couple of our younger faculty, and it's crazy. Like now, I guess I got to call myself old, but um, they're really going to be all stars, anterior segment and glaucoma yeah. wise. Uh, but we are so thrilled as far as what we've been able to build. I mean, when we started, we had just one fellowship spot and slowly kind of built it to the point where the residents were getting good experience. Wow. And until they got good experience, we really couldn't expand the fellowship to two. And now it's extremely busy. Um, they get a lot of volume and it's a ton of variety. And, and I'm like a broken record, but I've said it again, man. I, uh, I want them feeling comfortable being uncomfortable. So when they leave, they continue to learn. Like I don't That's want awesome. them to just keep doing the same stuff. So what, what can people expect out of your fellowship in terms of like uh, exposure to different cases and your faculty members and total volume and you name it. Tell yeah, me. no, I mean, if you're talking, let's just start with MIGS, like you're going to get the entire gambit. Um, we actually, with our tubes, we look at our own results, but even like non-valve tubes, uh, we each use different devices for a reason. So the fellow has exposure to literally pretty much everything on oh, the that's market. Great. Uh, it's great. And, and that's, it, you have to do that by design, right? As long as you're making sure that there's equipoise and you're not hurting patients, because we're not. But there's a lot of different tube options. There's different goniotomy options. And sure. there's different stenting options. So from the basics, the fellowship is built on the diversity of your experience. But it's also the diversity of your patient population. I mean, we're the VA is ours, the main hospital is ours. So you get indigent patients as far far as you know, hundreds of miles that come come to us. The VA is the same thing, and and even on the faculty side, like it's a totally different patient population. And and um, and then the clinics, uh, you have what I love is that they have their own clinics and they have their own oh, autonomy, nice. nice, and even some select ORs that they run themselves. And it's a ton of teaching. Like they have to staff the residents on oh, fake angle surgery. That is so, great. So when you leave, like you're 
you've seen it. And if you go into academics, you're ready for it too, because you've already been teaching. And clinically, man, I mean, all, we all do things differently. There's a huge academic side. CAS is still really involved. So we do a lot of just journal clubs and, and talking about cases on a weekly basis. Um, but I, I'm biased, obviously. Like, I love it. But I still have to pay homage to, like, who trained me. I mean, I, like, watched Ike and how he ran his fellowship. And you try to model it off of that because sure. I felt like it was extremely academic and um, an extremely high volume. Right, but you'll you'll get and, and, you'll get several hundred cases with a lot of variety, and, and you'll do that, your share exactly. of vitrectomies. So you're the the gas G A A S version <laughs> here in the U S. The U S. version. <laughs> that's exactly right. I love it. That's, no, that's right. Obviously, as a famous fellowship, it's it's great for a good reason. I mean, it just. Really... I appreciate it. No, it's uh, it's been fun, and we're all constantly improving every year. I mean, even this year, they're like, "Hey, I think you need to tweak this and this and this in the schedule," and so um, we we have to we have to change. Otherwise, you're you're never really stagnant you're either getting better or you're getting worse in my mind um i also like your the fact that you have a huge variety like the whole spectrum like you it said is. The, the, the ultra the indigent patients the va patients county type patients the old private pay, you get everything yeah you and, and you have to and you know the faculty work that way too so like you know typically sometimes you might see places where if it's indigent patient population or va population the faculty aren't doing anything like our clinics are staffed Sure. I'm at the VA. I pull charts with the resident. So it's not like I'm sitting there staffing. Yeah, I'm yeah. grabbing the patient charts off the main bin that we all share. You're cranking. You have to. Yeah. And, and honestly, like you lead by example. I love I love what I do. I love seeing patients. It's somewhat quality control. But um, yeah, the, the diversity, man, like you need that because the diseases might be the same in diagnosis, but the presentations are very different and the stages at which they present are different and the social cues at which the disease occurs are very different. And like I said, I want them leaving my fellowship being fantastic and able to handle whatever so, comes at them. So are they like often presenting like far more advanced than we'd see normally? Yeah. And if you look at the, the, the vets, I mean, it, um, look, man, I, I will never serve in the military. That's just not my thing. But uh, these guys did something and, and like, that's why I enjoy going there um, sure. to, to try to give back. But you know, it's a lot younger presentation, generally a little bit more advanced when, when they do wow. present. And, and it's tough. Um, those are the diseases. Like, and Uday, you know this, like peds, right? You get peds glaucoma or peds anything. Um, generally, there's so much life ahead of them outside. Like, ROP is just yeah. an amazing treatment sure. for them right now. But but there's so much life ahead of them. Like, you're looking at reoperations. And, you yeah. know, and, and when yeah. these vets are, like, early, that's what you're dealing with. And you start to see how, like... Yeah, but like, you know, five or six years later, your tube's probably not working the same. Um, and, and it's just, uh, it's humbling, actually, because they have so much life ahead of them. But it's also, for me, like a way to give back. And, and like I said, I like to make sure that I'm, I'm kind of in the thick of it with the residents and fellows. How are you planning for that? Let's say you do have a younger patient with significant glaucoma. And you know, this patient's got like 50, 60 years of life ahead of him yeah. or her. Yeah. I mean, and only so much conjugate timer, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, now I think my practice is patterns have changed a little bit, um, leaning toward primary tube shunts, just seeing how our like subconscious filtration surgeries like TRABs, Zens, angle surgery, you know, combined with FACO really does have power. Standalone GAT in the right patient young enough um, really can, can be efficacious, but we've tilted more toward primary tubes. Um, it reduces the need for second surgeries. And I think now that we have some data coming out as far as like, you know, do we tube next or in the assist trial or do we do diode next? Diode's mm. a reasonable option when you have a, a, a functional tube, not that the pressure's controlled, but that you have flow through the tube. Um, and so I think the practice patterns have changed and I think it's better for patient care now in the long run. And so when we're thinking about planning, I'm like, you know, depending on their case scenario, a lot of these younger patients, especially if the follow-up's poor, are gonna get a primary tube when the pressure's in the mid 20s. Um, we'll do that over trabeculectomy. And then we certainly have the other subset that still needs TRABs, um, but usually filtration, tube, and then probably like a diode. That's a reasonable approach, kind of guidelines. Now tell me about- it, it, Loose guidelines, exactly. Right. Like very customized, which is also the voodoo in all of this. <laughs> well, that's the art of it, right? I mean, there's, you, it, it can't be just a cookbook. It has to no. be an art that's individualized to the patient, tailored to yes. the patient. Yes, and I can tell you that um, even if you try it as an art, you guess wrong. I mean, you really do. And if we do it as a cookbook, you'll make mistakes too. And, and I, I'm, I'm more saying that so that people understand, like, I'm not trying to be so definitive all or nothing. It's just, it's how, how surgery is. It's how glaucoma is. Right. I, I found my surgery. It takes many years to learn, 
but a lifetime to master. Oh, it's so true. It's so true. I mean, like, look, how many, could you even estimate how many cases you've done or been a part of? Would you yeah. have any idea? Yeah. What do you think? How many tens of thousands? Yeah, in the, that, certainly uh, that, that range. That range, right? Yeah, no And question. you still probably will see something different at some point. Right. Listen, I, people are blown away when I tell them, <laughs> I learn more from, cataract, from making the cataract coach videos than I teach. I assure you, I learn far more. I 100% agree with that. And th there's a reason why I push fellows to edit videos during training. Ike did that with me. It was the best thing that he could have done. It forced me to pay attention to the other details, not just like what I was doing. Right. From even visualization to how I make my incisions to how I enter my incisions. It's like things you don't typically critique yourself in the time when you're really locked in. Right. But I agree with you. Just editing videos is, is the best way for a surgeon to learn. Well, I, I, someone asked me like, oh, do you have someone to help you edit the videos? Can you hire someone? I'm like, I can't hire a non-surgeon to edit a surgical <laughs> video because they have no concept. At some point, maybe you get AI doing it for you, huh? I, I doubt that though. It's uh, There is an art to video editing too, man. I mean, yeah. look how many people edit videos and post videos. Right. Do they have the same viewership or following that someone like you does? Well, there's a reason for it yeah. because it's educational. It's edited well. The key parts are there. The yeah. parts that really don't matter aren't. I mean, there, yeah. there's an art to it. And I, I think that's actually an important thing for trainees to think about is um, not only are you going to be better, but like you can really kind of push forward teaching too. If you have a really good ability to that's edit right. a video, I mean, that's very impactful beyond just your own patient population. But let me, let me mention for especially the younger surgeons, if you're under age 40, let's say, you got to make sure you're not overcompensating. The microscope view has to have the same focal plane as the video recording. <laughs> Do not, keep so submitting these, do not keep submitting these blurry videos. I can't use them. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah, we have that same issue. I mean, I still think I can like over accommodate a little bit. Um, but it's getting to the point where uh, here's one trick, though. Tell and me. you probably already know this. Just mag up. Yes, Zoom in. At the beginning. And that'll keep you in focus better than anything else. Yeah, yeah, for sure. At the very beginning, you set, set it that way. And yes. then also, pe people who are listening, you want to submit a video, learn to use the white balance. <laughs> Learn to use the brightness. That's true. Set your camera up. Do a little bit of homework. A little bit of reading. Come on. That's yeah, so. People also that's are such surprised a good point. when they're surprised they find out how much time it takes. Before our call tonight, I was editing a video of, of explanting a varicized iris claw lens plus doing a FACO and to edit a five minute video. Yeah. it takes a long time. Absolutely, man. I mean, like as far as making sure you have the key steps, the transitions look good. Yeah. It's logical, and then. You do voiceovers. I mean, that's the other side of it, right? Like voiceovers and the text and the, and just like the arrows. I mean, that's that's you are spending more time editing than you do on the surgery itself. Yeah, I uh, know, I know for sure. That is a given for sure. Yeah. And actually, you know what? It's it's interesting. Like we're gonna be seeing more of these uh, ICLs removed at the time of cataract surgery. This is gonna be like a whole thing well, that you're gonna have to start teaching. With the ICLs, I have many videos of, but I don't have one of a varicose, varicose. the iris claw one. Yeah. But yeah. I think we're seeing those now, more now because they're getting really bad endothelial damage. The patient I did the surgery for is about age 50. He got the lens when he was about 30, so he's had it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And his, his endothelial cell count went from 3,000 cells per square millimeter to, he's like down to 15, 1,400. Really? Okay. At yeah. age 50, which is like, yeah, mm. yeah, that's, that's dicey. That's dicey. Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at that, I wish that we had them approved for like aphakia. That's what um, I want too. I mean, it's crazy. Like you can put we, it behind the iris. Exactly. So you could enclavate behind the iris. There's not any angle pressure. The sizing isn't the issue like yeah. we have with like MTAs. Um, I'm actually okay with AC lenses uh, because even like so, as you hey, know, by the way, so am I. Yeah, you end up having complicated uh, fixation surgeries. That sucks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, those can be more brutal sometimes than an AC lens when you can see the problem. And in fact, I, let me let me ask you this. I've even thought about, you know, if you have, like, the right patient population a little bit older, why not do, like, a very small undersized AC lens, like an MTA, and just iris suture it? Because that's the fix for them when they're over-rotating, when they're, they're fit a little too small. And right. we just suture the haptics of the iris. It's easier than a posterior iris fixation. But I'm kind of like, look, if I'm going to do an AC lens, like maybe I do that. I don't have so, the so angle just, pressure. So, so just measure white to white and then just mm -hmm. use that. Uh, don't, don't like upsize from white to exactly. white. Exactly. Or just put a 3 UO on everybody. MTA right? 3 UO. Yeah, the smaller one. 3 UO and sutured, sutured the iris. Look, I, I'm not advocating that, but it's just interesting things to think about. And I'll tell you, I mean, AC lenses, 
hundreds I've done. So it's not like I'm like speaking from inexperience. Sure. Um, I do appreciate the posterior fixation techniques, and we probably now do more of those. But a good ACI well technique, I think, should be in every surgeon's back pocket. Let, let me tell you, the data shows, the meta-analyses show that a well-done AC lens has no difference in outcomes or performance as a scleral fixated PC lens. None. That's exactly right. Look, if you're already stacking the cards against you with a complex case that has no capsular support, right. your options are just going to be worse than your in-bag <laughs> options when you have no problems. So everyone's like, oh my God, like the AC lens is causing all these problems. Yeah, it can cause problems, but so can the other techniques too. And I'm right. so glad you pointed that out. Right. And another thing people don't realize as well is a well-done Yamane mm -hmm. requires a very thorough vitrectomy. Absolutely. Hopefully full parts planar yep. and the whole vitrectomy. But if you do an anterior vitrectomy, it's got to be pretty darn good because the number of these cases where you watch the lens being put through this, the lens is in the mid vitreous for half these acrobatics. And yes. they're winding up all those vitreous around the haptics and the patient's got a chronic CME. Now yes. we see the studies, the, the rate of chronic CME in a Yamane IOL is way out of proportion. Absolutely. And, and if you think about... Yamani, and now you've probably seen some of these like reports coming out. You know, the lens has these little haptic twists. Yeah. It's maybe, yeah. And so, like, you'll look at the post op, it's looking great. And then day one, like, it's extremely tilted. And this has been going around on multiple listservs. Um, it's not fraught without issues. I mean, we've explanted probably two or three now that uh, they were causing problems in the last like six to nine months. Right. Um, so, yeah. And, and here's the thing. Like, a fake is actually okay, too. If you're going to, if you're just not the right person for it, and whatever you're going to do is still going to have a high chance of a second surgery, just leave them a fake. It's okay. Let the dust settle. You can give it to someone that's doing it more often, and that's perfectly okay. But I still think if you had a proper AC lens technique, yeah. we've had, you probably had patients uncorrected like 2020, 2025 with an ACIO. Yeah, plenty. especially if you're smart enough, by the way, I got to say it here. Please stop putting AC lenses through six millimeter corneal incisions. Use the scleral <laughs> tunnel, people. I love it. I love it. You know what's awesome about that is I uh, am such a clear corneal incision guy. <laughs> oh, really? Um, Even for but, those, but like I, that six millimeter I, wide? Yeah, like yeah, oh my God. Uh, five point five to six, and 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 a uh, like a, a running mattress suture. But I'm, I'm telling you though, it it is important to talk about because like scleral wounds. I do think scleral tunnels seal better um you want to make sure they're sealed otherwise you could potentially have like a chronic leak and fibrous sure. downgrowth that's very uncommon the uh the corneal suturing though you got to make sure that you're paying attention to how you're suturing like if people are like driving in and they're like mashing the top part of the cornea against the bottom part and they're it's leaking and all the yeah. sill and astigmatism it's terrible but you can operate on axis relax quite a bit of cylinder with like a larger incision the sutures generally you can take out a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about lasering. Yeah. I can see a plus and minus for both sides, but I'm not going to argue against you. I think I think yeah. it's totally <laughs> reasonable. And scleral tunnels are a dying, uh, dying, dying technique. So there's another reason to, to make sure people know how to do them. Well, you know, this Verisize video that I was editing, I actually showed a contrast for me doing a case years and years ago uh -huh. where I did a, 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 a basically limbal corneal incision, yeah. six millimeters to explant it, sutured yeah. it up, and patient okay. And then this time, the one I the one I just did this last week, and I'm editing the video for. No, I did a scleral tunnel. Yeah, and I just yeah. I don't know. Maybe an older. I'm an old guy. I think no, I'm, actually, I'm more I, used think, to that. I think the, I do think the wound integrity can be better actually. Um, and and if you do it right, the the problem is I think people don't do it often enough. Sure. And so they end up sometimes a little too posterior, and now you're right up against the iris root, and it's prolapsing, and they hyperinflate. Um, sometimes if you're a little bit more anterior, maybe you can prevent some of that stuff. I, but you get into those situations and things are already on a, a bad footing. And, and that's, why, again, why I say a fakia at the time of like a major complication is okay if you're not used to dealing with it. You got surgeons doing like two, 3,000 cases a year with maybe like one or two vitrectomies a year. Yeah. I mean, how often are they going to use an ACI? Well, once every several years, yeah. right? It's very uncommon. Well, especially I had a... Someone asked me about a case recently where they had a broken bag and retained nuclear piece of the vitreous. And I just said, you know, I, let me give you permission. It's okay. Just close the eye and let your vitreous colleague clean up everything and put the lens in. Yeah. I think that, especially if that's what they're doing on a daily right. basis or a weekly basis. Absolutely. I think There's I said, no shame I think, in that. I think, I think my saying was, share the love 
and the, li- <laughs> and the liability with your retina colleague. <laughs> That's right. That's a good way to put it. I like that. You know, speaking of uh, videos on Cataract Coach, we had your bang video, which I thought Oh, sure. Was yeah, so... yeah. You were really nice to put that out there. I loved it. So tell us more about the procedure. If you haven't seen it, you just got to go to cataractcoach.com, type in the word B-A-N-G in the search engine, and I promise it'll come right up. Well, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you some funny background to that, actually. Teach me. So um, it really started because, again, like we treat a pretty large indigent population, and um, patients that were like on meds, even like on the resident service that... You know, everything that you add still has cost. And so for goniotomies, um, it's it's literally just like a reverse cystotome, essentially. Uh, There is a little bit of technique to it. It, it, The nice thing about it, Uday, I love the fact that when people do it, like our trainees do it, it really makes you hover into the canal. You push a little too deep, it'll tell you that you're catching the back wall. But you take like a 25-gauge hypodermic, you can use a 27. As long as it's 5 eighths inch long... You'll cross the angle. If it's half an inch, there's some angles you're not going to hit. And you can use a needle driver. Um, Mateen with Epsilon has like a little bender that that you can actually buy. And I have zero financial interest there. Um, It's not named after me. I don't want it to be. But um, you can bend this needle to the point where it gives you almost like a a nice little curvature to it. And um, and the gonadomy part actually works nice. Uh, We have like some early results that we published. We're collecting much longer term data um, but it is a way to do a goniotomy relatively cheap. Now, the devices um, out there that do goniotomies, I think they're probably better at collecting trabecular meshwork. So sure. we run some research studies, um, and Carlos Siegfried's like the lead on, on a couple of these glaucoma projects. And I think we all agree like it's probably better to collect the TM if you're trying to take it off. Uh, but as far as jumping into angle surgery without like a big commitment just to see like what it's like, I think it's a, a nice way to jump into it. But the funny thing about the name... Um, you know, I got to be careful how I word this. I, I really kind of, I'm hardcore into academics. I'm, I'm in it. Uh, I don't think that's ever going to change. Uh, but I do think we take ourselves too seriously. And so <laughs> I remember when we first, uh, when we first did it, it was actually on a healthcare patient, uh, worker who was a patient and, um, kind of followed it out. I was like, you know what, this might be like a thing. Um, and then we started it a little bit more on the resident service. And, and then I was at the VA, my fellows across the hall, I was like, you know, Tommy, I'm going to call him out. Tommy, shoot, great guy. Uh, we uh, we got to come up with like a name for this so it sticks. And I don't want it to just be like every other kind of name. So we, we actually really came up with the word, like what would be just like a weird word that would kind of be out there. And then we could kind of fit the acronym into it. Um, so it was a lot of fun kind of going back and forth and That's great. just bucking the trend a little bit, man. We take ourselves too seriously with some of this stuff. Oh, that's fantastic. So yeah, I think the, the neatest part is, I mean... We have a lot of cataract coach viewers from around the world. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of patients and doctors in places where a lot of these fancy supplies and fancy instruments are just not possible. They don't have and, it. Yeah, New World New World does well sending stuff out there. Um, I don't want to speak for Sight Sciences, but I'm, uh, there's a goniotomy device that they have. And um, I'm sure if you talk to the company, I mean, they're, they're still really in it to help patient care. Sure. And so if you had a need internationally, I would reach out to them first. But if you don't have access... Um, yeah, this sutured gat, those are two ways to, to address the angle without leaving a device and, and being able to actually try to impact uh, patient care that way. And so with the, the sutured gat, you're using a 6 or proline. Are you doing that little softening of the tip of it with a little cautery too? And all yeah, that? I cauterize a little bit. Um, proline is going to be better than nylon. You can use both. Uh, certainly the catheters that are out there on the market, they find the angle better. Sure. Um, it, it, maybe that's the wrong way to put it. They track in the canal better once they're in. Um, and so I, I think with the sutured gat, the nice thing is just accessibility as far as the cost goes. And, and I'll tell you, there's data out there now that you probably don't even need to do like a 360 treatment. It could even do fine with like 180 to 200 degrees, probably a little bit less bleeding that way. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that has changed glaucoma on the adult side. It's funny because Peds was doing a lot of angle surgery sure. before the adults got on. Yeah, yeah, 20, 20, 30, 40 years ago, forever yeah, ago. exactly. <laughs> it's, just, it's kind of funny how that all works out. It does, and and but we applied it appropriately, right? Like, in pediatric glaucoma, it's a very different mechanism in some some respects. Uh, but if you're looking at like anterior TM based obstruction, hopefully your collectors are still functional and patent. I mean, the, some of the assumptions, which is why we start with goniotomies and trabeculotomies, ab external or internal, and MIGs, angled MIGs, and I think this is where people really need to understand it was designed for early in the disease course. That's when we know sure. that some of these things sure. work better in the 
kids. Now you still have to do traps, tubes. But angle surgery, when you start to really push it, people that have been medicated for like 10 years, like, you know, their mean deviations are minus 24 and they're not on under good control, probably not the best candidate for an mm. angle procedure, right? And you not, and look, not enough, right? Have, yeah, not. you're going to have these anecdotal wins. I'm not going to argue against that, but by and large, that's probably not the right way to go. You know, are you doing a significant peds population too? I was actually doing a little bit more peds. Um, our peds service is fantastic. Uh, this was up until maybe like a year and a half ago. Um, most of it now that I do is on the anterior segment side, or if they've already had like a uh, ab external goniotomy or trabeculotomy, um, or even like a primary tube shunt or, or trab. Our, our peds stocks are, are are great. So, so wow, your uh, your fellows really really do get the entire spectrum. They they really will. And if you're peds oriented, and I always am very honest, like we don't have a true peds service, but you can get involved. They actually go and rotate with our pediatric ophthalmologist to to observe surgeries. And if you're really into peds. Maybe it's not the best place here, but you do so much angle work, you're ready to go. I just yeah. don't want to end up being the one responsible for like amblyopia, right? Yeah. Uh, but like the microsphere, fake uh, Marfans, dislocated lenses that they still get, post traumas. Uh, uh, I, I will never forget a case that I did with one of our fellows who, I mean, Uday, you should have seen this eye. Uh, the Tell iris, me. it was such a large iridodialysis, like six clock hours. It was scrolled up into the visual axis with a dislocated oh cataract and high pressures. And this kid, um, it, it's great because, you know, he was really into, like, bull riding. And he was, like, maybe what? 11 or 12 at the time. And he'd come <laughs> in in cowboy boots. I mean, it's just the cutest thing ever. And um, and that eye was literally 2020, despite a macular scar. Uh, wow. With the eye was fully reconstructed, iridodialysis repair, un like, you know, unfolding the iris in order to suture it for a pupil aplasty. Capsular retention segment for the cataract part. I mean, those wow. are the moments, and I'll tell you, like, I always have them every year where I'm just like, wow, the fellow just did that. You know? That's cool. It, yeah, oh, yeah, it's so sure. cool. It's so cool. Gives me goosebumps even talking about it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, those kind of patients that makes you thankful to be an ophthalmologist, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, and, you know, it's, it's funny. I'll never forget, like, my first um, – it was an extra cap at Wash U. Like, I mean, we were a little bit more traditional at the start. We would start with extra caps. And uh, it was a nonverbal patient who um, his sister brought him in because he had bilateral dense cataracts. And maybe he was like in his 50s or 60s and, um, and nonverbal. And she was like, you know, he's just been so much more depressed. Like at the skilled nursing facility, they're saying he's like eating less. He's losing weight. Uh, we think he can't see. And they were right. I mean, the cataracts are really dense. So I extra capped one side. It was, I think, my first extra cap, um, and probably like my second like cataract surgery ever. Yeah. And so the next day, you know, they're under a block. So the next day, he's patched, and they they take the patch off, and he looks around the room, and he sees his sister, huge smile, and he just starts waving at her, and she oh, looks back, melts and your she heart. just starts waving back, and they're just going back and forth waving, and I'm sitting here like a this bystander, like witnessing like. It's pretty special, you know, That's and she amazing. was like in tears, like she hasn't seen him smile. I mean, it was like, that gets you hooked. That, yeah, uh, I think, sure. I think you do that, you really, you really get hooked. Now tell me about your path to ophthalmology and actually specifically even glaucoma. What made it was you not glaucoma, ophthalmology? And it was not ophthalmology, Uday. I, uh, I was, <laughs> I, my dad was a pulmonary critical care doc in Baton Rouge. Um, for many years, he was like one of the only burn unit attendings actually. So busy, um, I mean, he was working seven days a week. Uh, sure. We just knew, like, on Saturday, Sunday, he was going to come in uh, after he rounded, and we'd eat lunch together as a family every weekend, but it would be always later. Um, he uh, kind of actually steered me toward WashU because they had a really good pulmonary critical care division. <laughs> <laughs> so I went there for medical school, and then um, ophthalmology kind of sprung up a little later because actually what I wanted to do was uh, – I will never forget his name, and I'm going to call him out. It's Israel Ziegelboim. He was a Gynonc fellow, um, fantastic guy, and – uh, this will make a little bit more sense as I kind of progress, but Gynonc to me was like the path I was going to take. Okay. And it was because it was patients that really didn't do a whole lot to get the diseases that they got. And there were terrible diseases. And I think the surgeries were lacking. It was really tough. I could not do labor and delivery. <laughs> so I don't know how I would have done like with that residency. But, um, mm -hmm. but then when I went into ophthalmology, that was also... A different kind of pathway. Somebody else introduced me to it a little later in the game. Um, I was thinking I was going to do retina like everybody else. You see the retina and it's great. But then 
you started thinking about glaucoma and that's a disease again that's not self-inflicted yeah. and it strikes and you don't know why i mean we still generally don't know why and it's chronic it's long term so you're truly doctoring you're trying to be preventative you can intervene with medications you can intervene with surgery but you have to be able to counsel the patient and talk to them and get them through sometimes mm -hmm. what could be a very blinding condition that you know they're going to lose vision from. Um, so to me, it's the consummate doctor in treating diseases that aren't self-induced. They're truly diseases. But in my mind, the glaucoma surgeon, the glaucoma doctor is a true physician. And you, the nice part is too, you have that longevity where you treat the patient longitudinally over years to decades. You do. And you can try... To like, I'll try to run my practices more of a like cons consultation service. Like patients are coming in, and we're trying to get people in that need surgery. Because I mean, I think all of us are overrun, um, but they still come back. Like it's not like you still have chronic long care patients, no matter how you try to run your your service. Yeah, I mean that's the one tough thing for me doing just catheter refractive, where listen, it's catch and release when this when your surgery is yeah. done, when you're bilateral cirrhophagic. I almost never see you again. Well, cataract surgery is such a fantastic surgery. That's the other side. I didn't want to give that up. Yeah. It's not that it's easy. It's that ophthalmology has made it so reproducible and the training is so good that you can get fantastic outcomes across a broad population of surgeons. Yeah. It doesn't make it easy. Yeah. It's just that we are so good as a field of fine-tuning this thing. And that's a tough one to get rid of. Actually, our retina fellows, we get them doing... Uh, cataract surgery because I think many retina fellowships are kind of like oh you're just going to do retina because of practice patterns when you get out into into practice but I love it man I, mean, I think I don't know if I could continue to do ophthalmology if they told me you're done with cataracts it's the fun surgery I mean obviously with cataract coach I'm cuckoo for cataracts there's no Dude, question about it but that, that's it's, it, I'm telling you it's so <laughs> critical because yeah. most people are going to have that in their practice so the stuff that you're doing on education it's extremely impactful across the board I mean this is across subspecialties right like from comp to glaucoma sure. to cornea to some retina. Um, you have some neuro-op people doing cataract surgery. Like that's a broad, broad reach. Yeah, I saw my confession too regarding retina. When I was a first year resident, I was like, I'm doing retina for sure. I'm doing retina. <laughs> and then like I started to do like cataract surgery. Like, whoa, whoa. I'm like, it's pretty nice. I know. It's and then back, I'm older. So I finished residency in 2000. <laughs> So when I finished residency, there was, there was no anti-VEGF, there was no right. OCT machine. They were doing macular translocation surgery for macular degeneration. Uh, that didn't work out so well. <laughs> so it was a really... That was, uh, that was crazy. What, what a wild time, like going from that to intravitreal injections to take like a surgical disease and turn it into a medical, right? Right. But I think the one, the one part where we may have not done a great job on the retina side is... The amount of funds shunted over to companies making anti-VEGF drugs, it's just, it's, it's staggering. It is a lot. I mean, look, I'll tell you, I'll probably be the last to talk about cost because I think a lot of times, like, we don't have all of the variables, you know. Yeah. Um, how is it as far as the patient follow-up and, like, when are they pulled from their job and how many people does that impact? And so it's not always, like, just the cost of the surgery or the device. But it, we do funnel a lot of money toward wet AMD. It's a lot of money. But I'm just saying even the proportion of the money that's paid. Yeah. Surgeon fee versus drug company money. Oh, yeah. Sure, it's, sure, like, sure. it's like 95 to 5%. It's, it's yeah. Really I don't know those numbers, but I know they're pretty tilted in that favor. Let's, let's change gears for a second. Talk about a little bit more academic life. Academic okay. ophthalmology. So I actually, I don't know if you know, I, I actually retired from teaching residents late last year. No, I didn't know that. Oh, 22 years. I did Man. my time. But it's time, Man. I thought it's time to change gears. Yeah. And so for me, personally, I loved it. I did it for a lot of years. I did it, I attended, I don't know, I'm guessing about 10,000 retina cases, I mean, cataract cases, maybe more, over 22 years. And That's I had great. basically 200 residents because we're eight residents a year. Some years, nine even. So we had a lot of residents we trained. Well, I had a fantastic time. And it was really, truly an honor. But I think it was just time for me to change gears. I had nothing left to prove. Yeah. I, I just, I don't want another teaching award. Five was enough. I don't need to say <laughs> Here, they're, they're on the shelf right here above me right there. I love it, man. I, I don't a, need any more. Is, is, isn't that a great feeling too, though? It is. It, but it was a fantastic time. And I do certainly yeah. miss it. Yeah. I love interacting with the residents. I, I miss the ultra sweet county hospital patients. Yeah. I know. The nursing staff, et cetera. But 
It's also, I think things are changing now. There's a little mm-hmm. bit more admin grief, bureaucracy coming into yeah. academics that I didn't see years ago. Are you? Is that across the country? No, you, you nailed it. I mean, I don't have that broad perspective like you do, uh, but just jumping into the program director role several years back, uh, it is concerning. The amount of administrative headaches that physicians and academia have with a dwindling reimbursement structure. Look, sure. it's the same, you know this, it's the same pressures in academia as in private practice as far as like, you got to make your salary. It's not yeah. like the money's just appearing in midair. <laughs> now, if your chair's got a ton of like chaired positions that he can offer people, fine, there's like an offset. But it, there's a reason why in general the salary is going to be lower in academia because residents and fellows are going to slow you down. They don't make things faster. And that's like the yeah. whole misconception. Now, the flip side is, I love what I do because, like, in June, I mean, we alluded to this. Like, you see where they're at. You're just like, this is incredible. And then I hit July. I'm like, oh, my God, what's just happened here again, you know? Um, but, the, but the academic lifestyle, I yeah. I do want to, like, impart on people. It's not for everybody. It's all you know. But most people are going to be happier in private practice, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with running a proper business, being efficient with it, making a good patient experience. Um, to the point where I love that we lean on our private practitioners in our community to actually help our residents out. We hold like a dinner every year, talk about contract negotiations, and um, there's usually only one faculty member that's there. The rest are, are, are doctors that, that partner with us in private practice. Most people are going to do better in private practice. And academics, like what's interesting is you kind of see this divide, like people that are really young or just a little bit older. There's not a whole lot in the middle. And what tends to happen is they kind of like are like, wow. You know, I'm still under the same pressures to produce, same pressures to like run a volume to make my sure. salary. And I still then come home. I mean, my wife's a great example. Like we were both in academia and then after a couple of years, she decided to part ways and um, and we would both come home and have like an hour and a half, two hours with the work on the laptops. We'd sit together, kind of do work. And now she comes home like, yeah, she's got other stuff that she deals with. Sure. But that whole administrative burden side is gone. Um, And I do think, especially now in today's culture, we're losing the ship a little bit with what's happening as far as the checkboxes and the metrics and the bureaucracy and creating more work to create more jobs that create more work and the oversight. I mean... (laughs) How many more middle layers of admin? Unbelievable. Just the the layers and layers of admin. Layer and layer. And someone... Comes in, they got to justify their existence, so they're going to create a new rule. We never peel back rules, we just add them. Well, you know, I think there is one more option, which is what I did. So actually, for the, all of my 22 years since I finished my training, I've always done a private practice mm-hmm. and separately some academic stuff and did a hybrid. Yeah, I think that's a great solution. Actually, that's probably... Most people, I think, like just looking at a residence, they really think hard about going into academics because that's all they know. And sure. I just told you... Like most people should not be in academics. Um, that type of a model is something that I'm seeing more and more of people wanting, where they're affiliated with universities. But you know, Uday, that was like the original way. Like it was like ophthalmology and ENT. Like many like East Coast universities yeah. had just not volunteer, but like affiliated faculty that had practices sure. that would come in and teach. And there's still yeah. programs like that. Uh, do I think that's going to go that way? Probably not. I think most places are full time. They're going to stay full time. But there is nothing wrong with that model. And it keeps you young. It keeps you on the cutting edge. You impact people beyond your own patient care, which I think is probably like the part that I love the most. Yeah, and I brought a lot of my private practice kind of mentality and know-how for efficiencies to the county hospital. When I took yeah. over as chief of that county hospital like 15, 17 years ago, they were booking four cataracts in the yeah. day. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, so first thing we're doing, I said, we're doing 10 cataracts every day. 10. That's yep. what we're doing. Yep. And it's going to work. And here we're going to track all the metrics and we're going this. And you know what? It worked. It works. It works. It's so funny you mentioned that. You know, there are built-in inefficiencies in academia. And some of it is just because you're teaching, like you're going to take a little bit more time. But that does not mean that it has to be as inefficient as what it is. Same thing. Our VA in the morning, gosh, like we were doing maybe like two to three cases. Now the residents like churning like six or seven FACO combines with glaucoma. Nice. You know, and sometimes it's like a tube or um, the fellow's going to do like an IOL thing, but it's a completely different ball game. But it requires buy in by your staff. Yes. Um, like at our VA, the, the staff really does buy in, like the nursing staff, to, 
Did it help patients out? Here's a here's a good story you're gonna love. Um, when I was a resident, uh, we had a huge cataract backlog because it was so inefficient, and I got frustrated hearing patients coming back like they wanted their second eye done. And so you're seeing them in your post op clinic, and it started with this bus driver. She was so furious that she was gonna have to wait another six months to get her second eye done. She's like, I can't do my job. Yeah. I was like, you know what? Why don't you contact like our congressional re- leadership, like staff at the hospital? And the patients did the work, and they did, and eventually they opened up ORs for us on Saturdays. So we started operating on Saturdays when nice. I was a resident. It was great. Um, so it was a true seven day work week, but you're doing cases even on the weekends. And- oh, but 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 now now program director. Work hour restrictions. Oh, uh, well, yeah, you can't. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Different world, buddy. Different world. That's so true. You know, but, but like it really did. It kind of forced them to think about like we don't clamor for efficiency because we're just trying to do as many cases as we can and get home. You want to help we're as tr- many people You're as you can. trying to help. People are stuck in line waiting for care. Yeah. That's why efficiency matters. And academia – can still be efficient. I got friends around the country. I mean, I'll tell you, like Joe Panarelli at NYU sees a lot of patients. He does a lot of surgery, hardcore glaucoma surgery. He's in academia. He's teaching. Um, it does not have to be mutually exclusive. Sure. Yeah, it's just, I think, keeping the idea, too, that uh, the way you practice today is going to keep evolving. Yeah. So, so you don't, as long as you don't get stuck in a rut, you can always keep thinking, all right, what's next? How else do I keep evolving this? And keeping that mentality, not only we're used to it on the surgical technique side, oh, I want to evolve to this technique and this technology and this new device, but also in the way you run the practice. Yes, yes, 100%. And honestly, if you are only doing what you were taught or only doing, let's say this, like your first couple of years in practice, however you ran it efficiency-wise, whatever cases you were doing, if that's all you're doing 20 years later, you You're probably behind. have not kept up with it, right? Yeah, we've, we've all seen that. We've seen the guy in the guy or gal in the community who's like, nope, even 30 years later, I'm only doing what I learned in residency. No, you're not helping people. Now you're practicing yeah. medicine that's 30 years old. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right? So that's the care that your patients are getting is the medicine that you learned 30 years ago. That's not the right way to be. You mean that doctor doing macular translocation surgery is not good? <laughs> I'll <laughs> um, just joking, obviously. No, I know, man. I know. So let me ask you this: So, so now, as, a, as being involved in, in residency programs and program drug, how do you choose a good resident now that fits your program when you don't have USMLE oh, scores? You wow. don't. You don't have. You don't have grades anymore because schools are pass fail, and they even said that AOA is bad these days. So no, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't because I'm of the old school. I, I know, in like junior AOA and grade board scores. And top of your class, and I, that's... Uh, listen, I, I, I am with you. You know, if there's a test that is, like, truly fact-based, like the USMLE, and it's not, like, built for interpretation, uh, I do think we need to change how sometimes we look at, like, just the outcome measurements and then try to backtrack. Sure. Um, it's really tough, and it's working. I mean, applicants are looking the same across the board. doesn't matter what school you're from doesn't matter where you might have been in your class. They just blend together now. So the societal metric of neutralizing everyone is working. Um, And actually detrimental to many people. Uh, You bring bring down the high high achievers to neutralize everyone. You neutralize everyone. And, And we're getting to a point where... People are going unmatched. I mean, it happened this year, unfortunately, even like with some of our own uh, medical students. They're top notch. Um, it's the Zoom era is also killing us a little bit. You can't really get a sense of like what that person is just just on a screen. Sure. Uh, and and like there's no interaction with them anymore. I hope next year we go away from that. Um, and away rotations might matter a little bit more. But I'll tell you, like. If there's going to be one thing that I'm going to say, and I talk about this, the problem is like people that have heard me say some of these things are going to be like, oh gosh, it's the same thing over again. But these are some truisms that I, I really do value. Teach me. I want to learn. Well, it's it's super simple. There's nothing like, like going to blow your mind, but I am looking for someone that is going to try to better the people around them. Like we remember classes like like years of like wine, right? It's like a good year for that wine or a bad yeah. year for that wine. It was an okay for that wine. <laughs> You're right. I don't remember like so-and-so stood out above the rest and they were kicking everyone down to get there. No. In fact, if you're trying to make everyone else look really good, the entire faculty, we're all going to remember you as good. That's what I'm looking for. 
That way the tide, the when the tide rises, way. all boats come up. Exactly, man. That's how it is, and people lose sight of that. And sure, it's good to have competition. Um, it drives you. Have your own internal competition. There are going to be certain skill sets that you will never have compared to somebody else, and vice versa. So be internally competitive, and your goal should be to lift everyone up around you. And then you are going to be successful no matter what you do. Well, I love it. And so you know, it's funny you say that. So for my 22 years of working with residents, you always remember those classes that I called cohesive classes. There you that, go. That year, all eight of them were like cohesive. together. And the way you could tell is, because they all have different rotations, that during the rotation, this resident would book his schedule packed with cases. Mm-hmm. And then the first week of the next rotation, he's also booking equally great tough cases and equal volume cases. As opposed yep. to the bad year class where they were not cohesive, that resident was like, no, he'd only book all the great cases for his block. Yep. And then for the following, the first or second week of the new block, he'd like, ah, just put all the junk cases there, put some, <laughs> just, and put very little volume. And just like, what? I, I, you know, I never understood that. Um, I didn't operate that way as far, not, not like surgically, I'm saying like how I interact with sure. my peers. Uh, I was really fortunate to be with the group that I, I, I was in. They all were just that same way. It's just selflessness, right? Like you're a yeah. physician, like, isn't that the goal? But um, it's amazing to me, Uday, like you see some of these people coming through and like their whole goal is to just like stand above the, the crowd, but it doesn't work. It actually comes off like in a negative way. Yeah, 100%. I still remember when I was a co-resident, I'd have a patient with a really tough case, like bad student exfoliation, does cataract. I'd only do the one eye and yeah. save the second eye for the resident who was following me which is my buddy John Lattice with the Lattice Super Formula and the AI and all that. We were co-residents. So we'd always it. like save each other like, oh, I did one eye. You got to do the other. We got to compare notes then afterwards. I love that. Man, like in fellowship, the same way. Uh, Harmon, co-fellow, I couldn't ask for a better one. Sure. And we would do the same every day, clinic or OR. We'd get on the phone. Hey, this is what I did. This is what this, is what this one faculty liked. Here's the mistake I made. What did you do? You're sharing knowledge. Like that's yeah. the best way for you to end up yeah. just being better. Um, but that, that's really the simplistic way of like, who are we looking for in resident? Now, the problem is it's really tough to find that letter writers. Now you're not going to ask someone who's going to write you a bad letter. You're going to ask, all, they're all, letters, all, all the letters sound the same. They sound the same. And, and this is why like now if you're neutralizing scores, things are going pass fail. It's a crapshoot. And remember the SAT was put in place to neutralize the playing field. Correct. So it was so we didn't have legacy people getting into the Harvards and Yales. It was so you could be from like a school that wasn't a classic Ivy League and have a way to separate yourself and now be compared to the people that were legacies. And now all of a sudden we think it's a bad thing. Now we can do it with a checkbox instead. I mean, yeah, it's, that's it's the a, problem. A, that's not why my room. parents moved here, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, listen, I, I totally get it, but... It, it's also it was one of the reasons why I wanted to also pull back from academics. I thought that was very that was very frustrating recently after doing so many years on the residency admission committee. It just things were just it just became very difficult. And then there, there were, are external pressures that I like would rather not comment on that I think are misguided. They come from a good place, but they're guided improperly, and and it right. does put strain on people that are trying to do the right thing when they're residency directors. That's just how it is, and and you will lose good people in academia. If, because of the way that academics sometimes is, is responding to social change. Time will tell. I guess we'll just see what plays out. It, it, it's always going to play out to the ultimate truth. Yeah. I, I, I mean, if you, you expand time far out enough, you're going to get there. Um, you try to force something, and eventually it'll still wind up where it should be. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's some good in, 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 in what is happening, but the burden... <laughs> <laughs> the academic burden and the administrative burden is going to keep some really good people out from doing so, so now, now you don't blame me for retiring after 22 years. Oh, not at all, man. Are you kidding me? I was me? like, sweet. You, no, I, I like view myself as like a sucker sometimes, man. I, I will full, like, I will admit that. Uh, I still, I love what I do and I'm not as far out as you are and, and I might change my tune down the line, but yeah, it's, it's not easy. I would never call it easy. Well, I just, I figured out all the paperwork. Like, what's the soonest I'm allowed to retire and take a bed? <laughs> And they're like, 52. I'm like, perfect. Done. <laughs> I said, let me just bow out gracefully. And it's not, I didn't drop the mic. Yeah. I passed the baton to the next generation of people. You know, people who are just in your 30s, it's time for them to shine. Let 100%. Me not, I, don't want, I never wanted to be that guy who's going to be sitting there, still teaching the residents, 
50 years after my residency and like, no, I didn't want to be that. No, guy. no, pull. I, I would, I would actually respect that. Pull out when you're on top. Yeah. Um, when you're at your prime, Peak you game. are. Yeah, it's a disservice when you continue to kind of hang on to that. Um, at some point, like I'm not going to be the clinician and surgeon that I am now, and that's I'm okay with that. We yeah. will all hit that point. I just hope I can recognize it before I I really start to slide. That's true. Hey, so I got to tell you. I'm looking forward to seeing you just next week. That's right. We're going to be together, man, in New Orleans, not far from my hometown, man. The New Orleans Academy of Ophthalmology. Atta, that is a fantastic region. I've right never here. been. Oh, I've been multiple times. It All right. Well, let's so do it, man. I think it's gonna, and The have, topics are great. Oh, I have a whole bunch of cases to show. Awesome. We're awesome. putting you, it. the panelists, on the podium, on the spot. I don't, I'm not going to tell you anything in advance. Don't, don't <laughs> clue me in, man. I am... Listen... Probably people will gain more from one of us up there just making like a boneheaded call than if everyone's like on point with what we say. But like most of the cases are actually me making a mistake. And so you, <laughs> you, you're all going to be poking fun at me and correcting me. So no, that takes that takes true humility, man. I appreciate that. So, but that's going to be a fantastic time. But I look forward to seeing you there and and talking I can't more wait. in person. But wow, I just I really admire your passion. I think you, the energy you bring to this field is just superb. I mean, we I remember hanging out with you at one of the Millennial Line meetings a few years yeah. ago, and you had an, an infectious enthusiasm, and I think that's so impressive. And I think it really, you are you are affecting a huge change on like the next new generation of guys coming out. I like, really for, appreciate that. For man. my rather, for Gio to say, no, Dr. Dag, I've, I've looked at all the fellowships. This is the one. I don't, I don't, I don't see how that's a thing. <laughs> um, it's extremely humbling to think about. I mean, I look yeah. at what you've done and you're telling me that and I'm like, just stop. No more talking about this. I don't, it's, uh, but I really do appreciate it, man. I, uh, I, I remember my dad coming home one day with the resident teaching award and it was like a plaque with an apple on it. And he was like teacher of the year. And, um, Probably one of my most proud moments of, of what he does, and he's done he's done a lot. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but anyway, I I don't take things like that too well, so I think we can uh, we can stop there. But I, I really do appreciate you saying that. Oh, that's awesome. And your and your dad is, has forgiven you for going in off the mall instead of pulmonary <laughs> critical <laughs> yeah, care. Yes. <laughs> Even if you're not doing palm critical care, you're still okay. Well, that, well, now I get to take care of his friends, so I think we're okay. <laughs> he's he's happy about that. Hey, once you start making his friends pseudo fakey, they'll love right. you. Like, wow, your son's the best. <laughs> that's exactly right. It's like that's like the, the best magic trick in all of medicine. It is. It is. It's, it's unbelievable. What a great surgery. It's just a magic trick. So anyway, a yeah. beautiful time talk with you. I really hey, enjoyed this. I bet our viewers really are gonna did. love this. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I want to remind everyone we can get all these podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, wherever you like your podcast. And we're going to keep up with these podcasts every other week coming up until this summer. Then we're going to go every week. Nice. Yeah. Nice. This is fun, man. I, I really do uh, enjoy hanging out with you, and I'm glad you, you got me on this. And we're going to see each other soon. Thank you for enjoying this interview with Dr. Arjun Shabani for podcast number seven. Fantastic. I know that you learned a lot. It was very much worth your time. And guess what? We've got even more podcasts to come. We're going to continue with every other week podcast until about June of 2023, and then we're going once a week. That's right, once a week. We're going to do 52 podcasts a year. And guess what? You know a guy right here who always delivers. It's going to be fun. I hope you stay tuned. Take care.